Now, unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard all about how AI will change our lives, supercharge economic growth, boost productivity. But a new study by our next guest says not so fast. Joining us now is Daron Ajumolu, economics professor at MIT. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so basically, in your new study, you tried to quantify, as others, of course, have, uh, what effect this is all going to have on economic growth. The difference is you came up with a much lower number. So talk to us, first of all, about how you got there. Yeah, guilty as charged. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of excitement about AI and no doubt that these models are performing things, doing things that people thought would be impossible 10 years ago. So there is a big achievement here. It's, uh, it's, it's impressive in many ways. But when you actually look at the data, most of the things that humans do, these models still cannot do. You know, in 50 years time, all bets are off. We don't know what's going to be possible, what's not going to be possible with AI. But for the next 10 years, we more or less know what the technologies are going to be able to do because uh, we have already the prototypes. They're evolving at some rate, and more or less we know what that's going to be. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but at least we can put some numbers in there. And uh, on the basis of other people's estimates as well, I come up with a number that about 4.5% of the things that American workers do can be impacted directly by AI. Many more things may be indirectly impacted. That's harder to know. But directly impacted is about 4.5% of the economy. And then when you take that and then put together with the, what types of improvements in productivity and reduction in costs that these models currently deliver, either because they're automating some tasks or in some in a few cases they're helping workers, then you end up with something like less than 1% of GDP, exactly like you've uh, just summarized. Well, it's interesting, Jerome, because I know you do work also on economic inequality, how these changes are sort of distributed. And so when you look at that increase, how is it going to be distributed? Who is going to benefit the most? Well, you know, the good news there is that if we came up with a number that said, you know, 50% of all jobs are going to be impacted by AI, then the distributional effects would be major. You know, there could be millions of people losing their jobs. But if it's only 4.5% or so of the economy, then the distributional effects are not going to be huge either. It's not going to be massive job losses within, uh, within 10 years. But the other thing that's interesting when you look at the data, you see that the kinds of occupations that are being impacted by AI are much more equally distributed across geography and across demographic groups than, say, things that were impacted by robots. Like, you know, if you look at robots, what did they do? They, you know, took over welding and painting and other things that were involved in heavy manufacturing, and that impacted blue-collar workers. Uh, that's a specific group of many of the male, low to middle education groups. Many of them were in places such as the Midwest. Uh, and so the effects were very concentrated. AI is much more dispersed, so it's not going to have a major uh, negative effect on inequality. But on the negative side, some people were dreaming that AI may suddenly make us more equal because it's going to help low productivity workers. We don't, I don't find much evidence for that either. One bad thing is, you know, AI, just as other automation technologies, is going to probably increase the gap between capital and labor. It's going to help capital owners and managers more than workers. You know, um, when you hear people in the industry, you know, I, I think of Jensen Wong talking about the AI revolution and a lot of other folks using that kind of language. You, of course, have looked at the history of other types of revolutions economically, right, the Industrial Revolution, et cetera. What can, what can we learn from those past historical big changes in the way that we work? Well, I mean, uh, Jensen Wang is, is absolutely right. There is a big revolution going on for NVIDIA stocks, and that's <laughs> those, those are doing better than any other stock that I remember for quite a while. So that's what you see from history as well. There are often some big winners from new technologies, especially the kinds of uh, sectors or firms that provide key inputs or the key expertise for new technologies can gain a lot uh, during the early phases of the Industrial Revolution. Some people who were first out of the gate in terms of building big factories made a lot of money. And people who are going to provide the GPU capacity 
either in the old form or computational capacity, let's say, either in the form of GPUs or other uh, types of chips that might develop over the next decade or so, you know, they're going to benefit a lot. But for the rest of us to benefit from new technologies, A, it takes time, and B, I think we need other conditions to be realized. So I don't subscribe to the view that, you know, ultimately, automatically everybody's going to benefit from new technologies. New technologies expand our capabilities, and AI is certainly doing that. But depending on how we develop it, depending how we use it, there may be a lot of inequalities that emerge. You know, the British Industrial Revolution, we owe our comfort, health, uh, productivity, all of this industrial technology to that process. But if you look at the first eight to or nine decades of that Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of hardship. Lots of people uh, uh, did not gain. In fact, real wages may have fallen for many groups of workers, including those in the most dynamic sectors of the economy, such as textile. So to avoid that, I think we do need more uh, sort of guardrails, institutional guardrails, be more careful in how we develop the AI technologies. And we, there are also other more recent examples we want to avoid, like, for example, social media. Uh, great, amazing technological capabilities in social media, improvements in communication that could have been truly transformative. But uh, there's a lot of evidence that we have created huge amount of polarization and mental health problems. So AI could exacerbate those things. So we have to be careful about how we use this very promising technological platform. Right. And while we have you, Daron, off of AI for just a second here, I'm just curious to get your general thoughts on where we are in the economy right now. I mean, we've been talking all show long about some of the recent economic data that we've gotten that has not been as encouraging. Well, I think on the whole, the U.S. recovery since the <clears throat> COVID crisis, in fact, to some extent, even perhaps since the financial crisis, has been better than other industrialized nations. And I think a very important part of it is this is a dynamic economy, but also uh, the government stepped in when it was needed, both after the financial crisis and uh, uh, after the COVID crisis. Of course, mistakes were made. Uh, you can We can go back and litigate whether we could have done it in a less inflationary way or whether uh, we could have done a better job in terms of financial regulation and so on. But the, the reality is that the U.S. economy has proven more robust than pretty much all of the other industrialized nations. And, uh, and that, I think, over the medium term is likely to continue. But there's going to be ups and downs. Maybe we're seeing a little bit of a down right now. We'll see how it plays out. Daron Ajamulu, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the program. Have a good day.